es un gusto tenerlos aquí. Eh, para nosotros eh, es un gran honor eh, tener eh, esta oportunidad de compartir con expertos de Brookings Institution de Washington DC la posibilidad de discutir junto con eh, expertos argentinos eh, los eh, inconvenientes y las potencialidades de la pesca en el Atlántico Sur. Eh, eh, voy a pasar a, al inglés eh, con el objetivo de que nuestros invitados eh, extranjeros puedan tener una versión completa de nuestras eh, intervenciones. Uh, it's, uh, I was just saying in, in Spanish, but I translated to English that it's a great honor for us to share with Brookings and with uh, Wanda Felber Brown uh, and Sarah Mesnik, uh, along with Argentine experts, uh, this session on fisheries in the South Atlantic and the challenges that arise uh, from this issue. Um, Argentina um, is a country with uh, a huge uh, sea and, and of course fisheries are uh, an important aspect of many, many, many public policies in Argentina. Uh, this uh, issue is also uh, a complex issue for international reasons. Um, Argentina has a conflict of our sovereignty uh, around the Malvinas Islands, Falklands in English, and that uh, introduces a series of problems in terms of the governance of fishing in the South Atlantic. Uh, there have been different instruments that uh, were signed a long time, but this has um, decades already. Uh, what I will do now is do the presentation of each of the panelists. Uh, thanking again to all of you to be here. I will start with uh, Wanda Felba Brown. She is a senior fellow at the Strobe Talbot Center for Security Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy at Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. She is a world known uh, in international relations, security. She worked uh, in many countries around the globe and she is uh, very recognized in the U.S. and the academic, in the academic field. Um, Sarah Mesnik uh, is uh, a very, very uh, renowned expert. Uh, with um, she's at the at the let me sorry uh, at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and she also uh, works at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. That's the right way of presenting her. Um, then we have on the Argentine side, Ambassador Carlos Rosale. He was he's a very experienced diplomat, uh, uh, a person with a huge uh, acknowledgement in the diplomatic uh, field in Argentina. He has been ambassador in the UK. Uh, he has been also ambassador in South Africa and uh, is a very uh, renowned expert in these matters. He knows the, the conflict around Malvinas perfectly. And uh, for us, it's uh, a pleasure that he is with us today. Ernesto Klocker is a senior retired officer of the Argentine Coast Guard. Uh, he basically put in place the system that the coast, the Argentine Coast Guard uses to track fisheries in the South Atlantic. That system works uh, rather uh, in a very good uh, manner. Uh, it's um, a system that has helped Argentina to improve its control over its uh, economic zone, exclusive economic zone. 
So uh, for us, it's great that he uh, joins us today and he's um, a person with a lot of experience in what happens in the day-to-day -day basis in the South Atlantic in Argentina. Um, each of the participants will speak for 10 minutes and after that, Diego Fleitas will moderate the Q&A session. Uh, being that said, uh, we start with uh, what's order, uh, Bill? Sarah. Uh, Sarah first. Sarah. Sarah, if you please want to go ahead. Thank you very much, Alberto, for the introduction and to Diego and the Universidad de San Andres for the invitation uh, to share this virtual platform with all of you and for all of you in the audience that are joining. These are really important times to come together to address the challenges facing our ocean. And this is a rather rare opportunity for me as a biologist to join with such an esteemed panel. And I appreciate the opportunity as well as the insights that we'll gain. Today, I'm gonna to speak about fisheries conservation problems and opportunities. And there's three main points that I'd like to make. First, why fisheries conservation is important. Second, to share thoughts on what works to conserve and manage fisheries. And third, to highlight how IUU, illegal, un unreported, unregulated fishing undermines these efforts. So why is fisheries conservation important? Uh, two reasons. Uh, first, fish is food. And second, fish are important for the health of the ocean ecosystems. These are obvious. Uh, but un sometimes underappreciated in how important our fisheries work out on the ocean is to human health and the well being of the planet. So, fish is critically important to food security. And that's our ability to meet the physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food for people on the planet. A significant portion of the, of the world population relies on food from the sea. About 3.3 billion people uh, rely on fish and about a billion people depend on this as their primary source of animal protein. And this is especially important in developing countries where livestock is scarce and for many of the world's poorest people. Fish account for about 15% of animal protein intake by humans globally, and in coastal re regions, that's obviously much larger. Uh, seafood is a unique source of high quality omega-3 vitamins and minerals. These micronutrients are vital for physical and cognitive development from fetal growth through infancy and childhood and for maintaining good nutrition and health all throughout adolescence and adulthood. It's an incredibly good source of protein for the planet. Seafood is also important in terms of the environmental footprint of our food. Our food systems are some of the biggest impacts we have on the planet. This includes our carbon emissions, our land use, and water consumption. And in all of these areas, seafood compares favorably to terrestrial sources of protein, such as beef or lamb or pork. And eating fish is generally good for the planet. Fish employs and fishing, employ, fishing and the food, seafood industry employs an estimated 40 million people. And many, a um, big part of the economy in developing African and Asian countries work in this industry. So I wanted to begin this way to inspire you to think about how your diet impacts the health of the planet and how to align interest in fisheries conservation and combating climate change with our ways that we acquire our food. The second thing I wanted to mention here about why fisheries conservation is important is that healthy oceans are critical to the health of our planet. Not only is it important that we preserve fish for future generations, but preserving the ocean for future generations is critical to the planet. We are currently in an extinction crisis 
we've driven the rate of biological extinction by humans, the permanent loss of species to unprecedented levels. This stresses our ocean dependent communities and imperils the planet um, as well. Over a third of marine mammals and nearly one third of sharks and shark relatives like rays and reef forming corals are threatened by extinction. And estimates show that between half and maybe a million species, both terrestrial and marine, um, are threatened with extinction and these rates are accelerating. In the ocean, it's fishing is the single greatest impact on biodiversity over the past 50 years. To sustain the amount of global fish catches, fishing fleets have had to venture out farther and deeper, harvesting more of ocean resources. Coastal land use and sea use also has a large impact on marine biodiversity. And a third growing driver of marine biodiversity decline in the oceans is climate change. And this is expected to decrease ocean net productivity and also fish biomass by the end of the century. The loss of marine biodiversity is weakening ocean ecosystems and its ability to withstand disturbances, to adapt to climate change and to play a role, its role in the ecology uh, of the oceans as well as a climate regulator. So it's imperative for both human health and the health of our planet to conserve and manage ocean resources. So when we talk about fisheries conservation, what are, what are we talking about? And when you hear the word, word sustainability, this is a broad word, means a lot of different things to a lot of people. But I turn to the FAO, uh, the Code of Responsible Fisheries. This is driven and is um, similar to many codes of responsible fisheries in the US and other nations. And it includes many components, but in general, it's the how to look at the right to fish as carrying with it an obligation to do so in a responsible manner and to ensure effective conservation and management. And what that means is preventing overfishing, protecting habitat and ocean ecosystems, using science and technology to manage and monitor fisheries, abiding by rules and regulation, providing safe working conditions, protecting subsistence and small scale fisheries and many other things. So it's a broad word that encompasses a lot. The history of sustainable fisheries is not new. Uh, we can turn to many indigenous cultures around the world that have long histories of fisheries management going back centuries in which um, places like Hawaii is a great example where 1 million or more people were fed by sustainable agriculture and fisheries. So there's a lot that we can learn about how to leave fish in the ocean for future generations and not waste the fish that is landed and to eat um, and eliminate waste. For industrial fishing, um, starting in the 1940s and through the 1970s and 80s, it became increasingly clear that there were large um, and inexhaustible fisheries, or what were thought to be large and inexhaustible fisheries, were collapsing. Um, here in California, one of the famous ones is the sardine fishery in central California. John Steinbeck, uh, the author, wrote about this collapse. Um, herring collapsed in the Atlantic, the Peruvian anchoveta collapsed in the 1970s, cod collapsed in Newfoundland. And these large collapses set the stage for both increased concerns and new tools and legal actions for fisheries management. And in the mid 1970s, there were a lot of new uh, laws and regulations, including the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone and um, a number of laws such as were passed in the United States, Magnus and Stevens Fisheries Conservation Act, the Endangered Species Act, and Marine Mammal Protection Act to preserve um, our fisheries and to um, make them more sustainable. Um, it's important to note that when we talk about sustainable fisheries, we're talking about a lot of very different types of fisheries too. About 50% of global food production is from artisanal or subsistence fishing. And that includes about 90% of fishers around the world. 
Industrial fishing uh, compromises the other 50% or so global fish production and includes throughout the world's oceans, about 90% of the world's oceans. Uh, fish is also the only, only important food source um, that is still primarily gathered from the wild. And this is very different in many ways from agriculture um, or when in discussing illegal activities like drugs or guns, things that can be manufactured. And fisheries have a harvest a wider number of species than terrestrial proteins. And this makes uh, sustainability complicated when you're talking about things from clams to shark and single and mixed species fisheries. So how sustainable are our fisheries? If we turn to the FAO and look at the um, fisheries that are um, tracked by the FAO globally, um, we see that the number of uh, fish stocks that are sustainably fished is slowly increasing, and the number of fish stocks that are overfished is slowly decreasing. About 65% of stocks, or about 83% of volume of fish is sustainably fished, but 35% of stocks are overfished, and there's significant room for improvement. So what works in fisheries conservation? Um, we know that fisheries stock abundances and fisheries management are related. And in regions where fisheries are intensely managed, stocks are increasing or staying near target levels. So in comparison, those without fishery management have greater harvest rates and about half the abundance. So this fisheries management is also a very large term and is involved in many aspects of the work that we do. It requires multifaceted assets, which include determining and monitoring the biological stocks, uh, the status of stocks, which means being out in the ocean and counting fish, implementing science-based harvest limits and accountability measures, minimizing bycatch or the incidental capture of non-target species, and providing for adequate enforcement and combining these into a ecosystem-based management. So it's a, a really involved, when we say fisheries management, it's really involved. Um, and examples of the rules and regulations that are known to work include catch limits, restrictions on, and restrictions on not just the number of fish, but how and where and when they're harvested. This includes gear restrictions um, established to minimize waste and bycatch of non-target species or that harm the ecosystems and prohibit prohibitions on fishing in known spawning areas, closures when areas get too low. And the major challenge is now to bring fishery science methods and sustainability to areas that remain largely unassessed and unmanaged. And that includes needing to understand what methods of management have worked in what social, economic, political, and biological context, and learn how to implement the most appropriate forms um, in locally, uh, local areas, and where enforcement and management are currently limited, particularly. And it also means leveraging healthy stocks into sustainable economic and social and nutritional benefits for the fishing communities and the people that depend on them. We also know that independent monitoring is really important. And this has been um, time and labor intensive. It's expensive and it can be dangerous, but we're increasingly turning to new and virtual technologies um, that build on the systems that provide safety at sea that are also adapted for small scale fishing, fishing and increasing um, ways of surveilling what is going on in the ocean from land and virtual techniques is increasing and is imp incredibly important. Bilateral and multilateral collaboration and action are important. And there's a lot of um, ways in which this can be done between countries um, within regional fishery management organizations and international organizations like CITES or the IUCN or the FAO. We know marine protected areas work. Um, highly protected areas are one means of achieving conservation targets. 
And we know that when marine protected areas are established and enforced, that they can increase the total biomass of marine life that are uh, produced, and that species tend to grow larger, produce more young, and that these benefits can spill over into neighboring areas. And lastly, um, I want to make sure to mention that community engagement and consumer interest in engagement are key tools. Incentive-based approaches build demand for sustainably sourced products, and they are um, ones in which social change can drive and incentivize change where enforcement or management and rules may not be, um, have the capacity to do so. There's many challenges to sustainability. Um, global fish production is um, high and demand is only increasing. As I mentioned, overfishing globally, about 35% of stocks are overfished. We have a lot of work to do. Climate change is expected to de um, decline or decrease marine biomass. Labor abuse is widespread and uh, a big concern to many consumers as well as the health of nations. Bycatch um, is the primary cause of mortality for marine mammals, sharks, and birds. And IUU fishing is estimated about 15 to 30% of the global catch um, undermines all of the efforts to make fisheries more sustainable. Um, IUU fishing is a problem for fishery conservation for many reasons. Um, by its nature, it's difficult to quantify. It harms legitimate fishing activities and livelihoods, it jeopardizes food and economic security, distorts markets, undermines ongoing efforts to implement um, policies, and it poses growing risk to biodiversity, particularly the loss of um, uh, fish, the decline of fish stocks, but also um, endangered species. And then the other things that we'll hear about, the tensions between countries, the threats and rule of law, including um, efforts to combat co corruption, criminal activity, including human trafficking, forced labor, and the benefit, um, how it, this is related to transnational crime. So fisheries conservation and IUU fishing um, must be addressed together um, to move forward. Um, the other uh, two things I wanted to mention about why IUU fishing is so um, hurtful to marine conservation is one um, other thing is the use of destructive gears. Um, many types of gears are outlawed, but blast, dynamite fishing, cyanide, and drift gill nets are um, commonly used in illegal fishing and they undermine um, not only the health of the fisheries, but often the ecosystem in which those fisheries live, whether it's coast, whether it's such as coral reefs um, or coastal zones. And on the high seas, drip gill nets are large scale um, passive nets that indiscriminately capture um, not only fish, but also marine mammals and turtles and sharks. And then um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, IUU fishing um, is a big issue for non-target species. These are bycatch, these are the marine mammals, sharks, turtles, and seabirds, and it results in significant negative consequences for these species. And the, I wanna close with just a few comments about a species I work on, the vaquita. The vaquita is a, a small porpoise, the animal is about my size, and it lives in the rich and productive waters of the northern Gulf of California in Mexico. I just returned three days ago from a survey um, looking for vaquita, and I personally have watched the vaquita population decline from about 600 animals down to around 10, which we have now. And this is due primarily to the increase in um, illegal fishing for uh, a fish, the totuada. It's a large uh, croaker. It's harvested, um, prized um, for its swim, bladder. its swim bladder that um, is prized in China. 
And each um, a large swim bladder can be worth up to $100,000, though the prices have changed over time. And IEU fishing has thrived um, in uh, the region uh, for a number of reasons that show how wicked these problems are. Um, they've, the complexity um, includes the lack of fisheries management, corruption, impunity, and an in increasing um, uh, incursion of, oh, I'm getting uh, some funny noises on my computer here. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Let me just finish um, by saying that this, the complexity of the problem, the incursion of criminal networks into trafficking Totuaba swim bladders and developing the black market, and then increasingly taking an advantage of the routes um, used for, for other illegal products, including narcotics, has made what was a simple at one time illegal fishing into a major international uh, IUU fishing that goes extends so far beyond the skills and the abilities of fishery scientists and managers to handle the situation. And this is why um, I feel very strongly about panels like this. I've worked with Vonda Felda Brown on this issue for a number of years now, that these issues, which at one point were threatening our food and our biodiversity are now threatening um, much greater aspects of human health and the health of our communities and our planet. And these kind of panels where we're merging what we know about the ocean and what we are really dealing with when we talk about um, IUU fishing and the tools that we need, the skills that we need, the people that we need to bring in are really um, the uh, important way forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for your uh, words. Um, we now uh, continue with Ambassador Carlos Cersale. Uh, Carlos. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alberto. Well, first, well, my thanks to uh, Brookings, to the University of San Andrews in Argentina, and Pesac from Argentina. And it's very nice to see two of my former collaborators at the, during my days in London, Commodore of the Navy Montero and Pablo Bonuccelli, that they were excellent representatives to Argentina representatives to AIMO. And it's uh, now that work is followed by Fernanda Milikai, that is a colleague. So that she helped me also in look at the legal framework for the presentation that I need to do, well, of the components of the legal presentations. So I was asked to <clears throat> look to the international and regional framework for, for fisheries protection. I will divide the, the presentation in three uh, themes. One is fisheries within, within internal waters, that is very well known as economic exclusive zone, that is not going to put much emphasis on that. The second, the second aspect is fisheries on high seas, and, it's, uh, and the freedom of fisheries subject to limitations according to the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And third, what was specifically asked in the title of the subtitle of the seminar, that is uh, fisheries in the Southern Corn, conservation, international organized crime, and law enforcement, enforcement challenges. That is always connected with uh, some geopolitical aspects that are related to the use of the Southwest Atlantic. Um, so first, let's at the, look at the first area that is fisheries with internal waters. It's um, here, even there are only, well, my previous, the previous presenter make, it was entering into very much detail of the different type of uh, resources that we have, that it's as found, as found in, in the Love Convention, there are nine, but they will focus only in two of them, that they're straddling, straddling fish stocks and the highly migratory fish stocks because are the ones who affect 
the fishing in high seas. So there are special regulations that need to be uh, followed on that. So um, uh, after that, so how does the regulation of fishing take place uh, through conservation and management measures? First is uh, how states uh, set a total allowable uh, catch that is called TAC or that is the objective is to prevent overfishing. I mean, what I mentioned is all the different components of the law of the sea that states from both sides, fishing states and states, border states should follow. Not sometimes they don't do that, but it's, it's what is in, the law says that. After that, you have quotas allocated to individual state and it's, uh, that is international or vessels from both sides. You have limiting of fishing efforts, for example, fishing days to prevent overfishing. You have gear restriction and prescription of the minimum size of the fish permitted to be caught to prevent the catching of immature fish. You have closing areas or closed seasons. Uh, you also can specify by catch levels, the different species being accidentally caught when a vessel is directly is fishing on another species that the previous presenter made, made a lot of, dedicated a lot of time to do that. You have closing areas to fisheries or specific fisheries geared to protect to marine, bio, marine biodiversity. And you have measures to increase economic efficiency, including limiting the number of vessels within my fish. Well, to have an, an idea of the geographic distribution of resources between the economic zones and the high seas, what we need to look is that 36% of the total area of the seas are economic zones, but the all the total of the catches are 90% of the catches are in that 36% of the seas. So between the economic zones. So that is something that we need to look always to try to understand, which is the problem that we are dealing with. Which are the duties of a coastal state? The rights of the coastal state are subject to a number of duties, also according to Article 61 and 62 of the Law of the Convention. You can determine the, the tax, the tax or the, the, the catch for each fish stock within the economic zones. You can adopt conservation and management measures. You can maintain or restore population of harvested species. You can take into consideration the effects of species associated with or dependent upon harvested spices, species. Or you can promote the objective optimum utilization of the fish stocks in the economic zones. In Argentina, we have the INIDEP, that is the institute who is supposed to deal with that. It's uh, also you have the legislative and enforcement jurisdiction. In the case of sometimes in the South Atlantic, Talking about the enforcement is like talking an oxymoron because that or a metaphor, because sometimes there is no capacity from the state to really to look into that. So that's something that needs obviously international cooperation. So because in this case, nationals of the states and fishing states in the economic zones, they comply with the observation measures. Um, and this provision allows the coastal state to enact laws and regulation of non-exhaustive list of subjects to apply to foreign vessels in the economic zones. Well, obviously you have that the coastal state may index exercise of sovereign rights to explore, explore, exploit, conserve and manage the living resources in the economic zone, takes that measure including boarding inspection, uh, armed and judicial proceedings as being necessary to ensure compliance with the laws and regulations adopted by conformity with the convention that is, Article 73 of the Law of the Sea. The, in the case of Argentina in the Southwest Atlantic, that is also, is a, there is an area of dispute with the United Kingdom that is occupied territory of the Malvinas Islands that makes more complicated the issue. But at the same time, it's possible to do formal collaboration through the scientific analysis of the stocks, of the fish stocks, in order to try to regulate the licenses in according with the British government, something that was done between 2016 and 2019. Um, 
Well, however, you have the obligation of the coastal state to promptly release and arrest vessels or their crews upon the posting of resident bonds of other security provisions. Well, now let me enter into what is more intricate, that is the provisions for the high seas fisheries that are more uh, not so clear areas. So obviously freedom of fishing on the high seas is su subject to the conditions laid down in articles 116 to 119 of the, of the law of the convention. Uh, that means that fishing in high seas is subject to treaty obligations, right and duties as well of the interest of the coastal states provided by the of other articles and other provisions. Duty, the duty of the states is to take measures for their nationals necessary for the conservation of the living resources of the high seas. When I'm talking about high seas, it's not just to talk about mile 201. The practice is that extend to 20, 30 miles after the economic uh, exclusive zones. Well, the important thing of the article 118, uh, that is a key provision, is that states shall cooperate with each other in the conservation of the management of living resources in the areas of high seas. States whose nationals exploit identical living resources, and different living resources in the same area, shall enter into negotiations with a view to taking measures necessary for the conservation of the living resource concerned. And, and obviously, as a result of this, they should both the fishing state and all the, the fishing vessels or the states who are uh, the, under the flag that are those vessels uh, fishing plus the coastal state, they have duties and that are similar to the ones applicable to the economic exclusive zones, including the determination of TAC, use best scientific evidence available, ensure the maximum sustainable yield, and consider the effects of associated species. That if that happens or not, that is another thing, but basically is different ways to look at what is the uh, straddling stocks and the highly migratory species for the different uh, type of, of, of the way that they move this. And it's, um, well, what are the problem of overfishing in the high areas? The question is to be put in an historic context. Even when many states, including Argentina and many coast, major coastal states, has advanced in declaring the economic, economic zones, exclusive economic zones, in the case of Argentina, we call epicontinental sea because we have our plat continental platform that extends for 370 miles from the, from the continent itself. Uh, before UNCLOS, it was the adoption of the convention of the consecrated the economic sovereignty of coastal state to their fisheries. And so in 1995, the United Nations Conference on Straddling and Highly Migratory Fish Stocks was convened following the call made by the UN Conference on Environment and Develop on Development. It said uh, that was 1992 uh, Environment Conference that everyone knows. Um, this conference adopted the UN Fish Stock Agreement, the UNFCA, uh, that looks at straddling and highly migratory fish stocks. The agreement provides for a system based on a regional cooperation between fishing nations and coastal states. And that was to establish organizations called Regional Fisheries Management Organization, RFMO, which would establish the total allowable catch that is stuck or allocated between member states. These RFMOs have the inspection powers at sea through ships of their members and other members, uh, through their members over other members. Argentina has been part of the core group of the UNFCA, but at the very end didn't join the RFMO for the region because for the unequal powers or how the coastal state and the fishing states or uh, vessels have uh, equal decision 
in the in in these agreements. So that puts the country who has the resources in a minority condition. So the minority in decision making issue is key to the application of the principles of compatibility and coherence between measures adopted in the economic exclusive zones and the high seas. That is the objective if you really want to preserve and to have really um, uh, agreeable tax in order to extend the uh, what is for the economic exclusive zones to the high seas, at least for the next 20, 30 miles. The minority issue was also uh, a key regarding the geopolitical problem of Argentina in the Southwest Atlantic for the Malvinas issue. But actually there were conversations with the European Union because in those days, um, UK was part of the European Union to have an agreement of that. And it's, um, but anyway, the point is the universal participation in the, in the, in, the, in this kind of regional arrangements. But it's, um, and now let me come to the third part that is uh, the illegal uh, and unregulated um, uh, and unreported fishing. Uh, I, you, you, that is the new term that also my, the, pre, the, uh, the previous presenter was making an issue to. It's, um, we recognize the need for transparency, uh, transparency and accountability in fisheries management by regional fisheries management organizations. And they should do the effort on that. However, the question is the problem is that all the states fishing in unregulated manner and illegal fishing, uh, is, they have inter different interests or interests contrary to the coastal states. And they don't apply the norms or they evade the norms that you have in the economic exclusive zones to which is the state is a member. So this unregulated term uh, arose to highlight the huge impact on the resources of fishing activities. And if they are not illegal, because they are outside the EEG, the economic zones, but are in the area of these RFMOs, is in which is flag state is not a member, those are reported, unreported in the natural effect, and they may have a natural effect of unregulated fisheries. So this is the concept of IUU that is illegal, unregulated, and unreported. The growth of China as a big fishing nation led to this phenomenon because according to the, to the RFMOs, the countries that are member to that, they can discuss which are the quotas allows to, uh, or also called Orops, it's, um, but China is not part of that. So basically they have an, uh, a way to uh, non-report of what they are doing. Besides, I think that now what is happening is a new F, is a new issue that it's, uh, in the case of IMO, they are looking at, uh, well, in, sorry, in the case of WTO, are looking at the subsidies for those fishing vessels that are receiving those fishing vessels, that in the case of China and, and Spain, and it's uh, to, that are subsidizing their fleets. And it's uh, uh, because in the case of Spain, there is uh, a fishing that related when they fish is based on the, the, the certificate of origin is based on the fish that is shipping and that gives the fishing grounds to the Galician economy that uh, they have 5,000 people working on that, uh, working on that fishing industry based on the catch on the Southwest Atlantic. So therefore what we have is um, ideally uh, countries, the coastal state and the fishing states or the flag states should have uh, agreements to try to reduce the IUU fishing. And that can be done through according to the port state measures agreements with port states must in principle close their port to vessels that have engaged in IUU fishing 
or could be the contrary, just opening in other ways to control. That is in the south of Patagonia, there are projects in, in the province of Chubut that are trying to open their ports to do that. Um, that is the case of, of Comodoro Rivadavia. That does not include prohibition of landing, but also to provide any other services. And so something that I think in Argentina, they should look into that in order to adjust to absorb what other neighboring countries are doing, like in Chile or in Uruguay. And it's uh, Argentina, well, it's not a party of these RFMOs, but um, uh, the I'm idea, sorry, idea, idea. Need to, uh, I, we need to wrap up because- Okay, we, I finished it now. Yeah, it's, um, it's in order to, Matter that to do. You have with the ones who are with the uh, flag vessels that are uh, abusing of why you you it's uh, I you you is uh, in the case of Spain is easy because you can do an agreement through the European Union, and in the case of China because it's not member of the UNFCA, you can do a bilateral agreement directly to that. That is what. Argentina, in my view, should do. It's not in the agenda, but I think that the future government should do that in order to try to establish an order and, a, and accountability and enforcement in the high seas fishing. Uh, China did a bilateral mechanism similar to one in Ecuador. So and that is a model to follow. So, well, these are the points what I was asked to to do that is which is the regulatory framework for the issues that we have in the Southwest Atlantic. And thank you for the, the to allow me to do this presentation. Thank you, Carlos, very much. Uh, Vanda, please. Great, well, good afternoon. Thank you all very much for joining us for this very important conversation that uh, really does not get enough attention about illegal fishing, particularly around the Southern Cone. My task in the webinar is to focus on the actors engaged in illegal behavior and to think about some of the illegalities uh, that are taking place and how they have grown. Uh, Dr. Mesnig and Ambassador Sarsal have previewed some of the dimensions that I'll speak about. Let me just quickly uh, reiterate uh, the threats that um, uh, Dr. Mesnig so very powerfully laid out in her, converse, in her opening remarks. Illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing poses major threats to biodiversity and to sustainability of a vital food source. However, it also poses, as she, as she mentioned very powerfully, a major threat to human and planet's health. But it has many economic dimensions beyond food security. There are issues of income for um, local fishers. Uh, particular small fishers can be uh, devastated as a result of uh, illegal fishing. Uh, it has implications for the viabilities of large industries that in many countries in the southern cone uh, are very important industries. For example, in Argentina, one of the um, uh, largest industry, the fishing industry, and of course, has implications for tax revenues um, for governments. So for example, in the Southern Cone, assessment range that economic losses due to IUU fishing range somewhere between 600 million and 2.3 billion, with uh, losses in taxes perhaps 500 million. And that's with data that might not be reflecting truly the full scope of illegal fishing taking place. Sarah also mentioned that uh, beyond uh, the the, uh, uh, the activity itself of illegal fishing, of fishing in violation of many different aspects of regulation, there is uh, increasingly um, the intersection of that illegal behavior with other crimes. So the very obvious ones are corruption and document fraud, uh, but more broadly, there is the perpetuation of poor regulatory practices as flags of convenience, loose port inspections, are exploitable not just by other criminals, but even potentially terrorist groups. Sarah also spoke about the usually atrocious label practices that can be associated with IUU fishing, including severe exploitation and abuse, forced labor, uh, trafficking, and even uh, sexual trafficking. 
However, increasingly, we are also seeing other dimensions of this convergence, specifically the linkages and connections between illegal fishing and drug trafficking. Not uh, just in this uh, traditional way in which fish, uh, fishing uh, ships, uh, both those operated legal and illegally, could be induced to carry precursor chemicals between Asia uh, and Latin America, such as from China to the Southern Cone, and carry drugs um, from uh, uh, the Southern Cone, cocaine, heroin, uh, to Europe, to the United States, uh, also increasingly to um, Asia. Uh, but in fact, we are seeing the rise of uh, major drug cartels now uh, using fishing uh, as a mechanism to transfer value, uh, to launder proceeds, to pay for precursor chemicals, and itself becoming a target, something I will return uh, to in a moment. And finally, I think we should all be very concerned about the possibility that uh, some of the actors engaged in illegal fishing, uh, particularly Chinese um, fishing fleets, uh, may carry uh, spy equipment. So who are the perpetrators of illegal fishing? Well, at the basic level, many of the illegal fishers or fishers who engage illegally, I should say, are poor artisanal fishers. Many are marginalized, uh, often struggling to make ends meet, lacking uh, adequate income, and finding it difficult to struggle with compliance with regulations, even if they want it. These marginalized communities um, are often highly susceptible to joining fads to supply particular uh, illegal product. Uh, Dr. Mesnick spoke about the issue of the uh, Totoaba bladder uh, in Mexico, uh, supplying demand in China, but we have already seen the vast expansion of demand for uh, bladder from croaker fish, that's the type of fish like uh, the Totoaba, uh, expanding uh, around the world uh, in various parts of the Asia Pacific region, but also dramatically around uh, Southern Cone. And it is often poor artisanal marginalized fishers that get drawn into providing this illegal supply with significant consequences for biodiversity, for bycatch. The second set of perpetrators of illegal fishing are uh, national industrial fishing fleets and industries. This is true of, of many parts of the world, uh, and it's also unfortunately true uh, about the Southern Cone, where um, the region often exhibits wide variety of the quality of regulation. Some regulation in some countries, such as Chile, can be of high quality. In other uh, cases, regulation in Panama, Ecuador, um, Brazil can be very weak, uh, as do law enforcement, uh, as maybe law enforcement capacities. Again, great variation in law enforcement capacities. But it is often national actors that are perpetrating significant amount of illegal fishing. In a place like Mexico, which obviously is outside of the Southern Cone, but nonetheless uh, part of Latin America and a country that we have spoken about, at least 60% of fishing conducted by Mexican uh, uh, fishing industry is underreported, potentially illegal. Very high numbers, uh, well, uh, and some of the estimates put it far higher yet than, than 60%. And of course, in many of these uh, settings, the legal supply often serves to harvest, uh, often, often serves to launder rather uh, the marine resources that are illegally harvested with poor monitoring, in, uh, poor enforcement, minimal penalties, fake licenses, and disregards for regulations regarding timing, zones, no offtake, uh, quotas widely regarded. Now, and let me just highlight Ecuador here um, uh, where, um, we often think of the next perpetrator, which is foreign industrial fleets, large Chinese flotillas hovering uh, around uh, the Galapagos Islands, just at the edge of the EEZ and uh, widely uh, penetrating uh, the EEZ and illegally fishing there. Enormous problem, but a lot of such activities also conducted by the Ecuadorian fishing industry, fishing fleet itself. So this brings me then to the third threat. Uh, perhaps it is the most serious or certainly one of the most serious, and that's the presence of Chinese foreign flotillas. 
uh, or I should really say um, foreign flotillas, of which the most dramatic example is that of Chinese, with some of these fishing flotillas um, numbering several hundreds of ships uh, and uh, violating uh, rules such as entering uh, EEZs, engaging in very destructive activities such as bottom trawling, often engaging uh, uh, in activities that uh, significantly undermine sustainability. And unlike even the fishing uh, industries of, of national countries, the national fishing industry really lacking a structure of incentives um, to engage in sustainability. China is not alone um, of engaging in illegal fishing off of the Southern Cone. Uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Russia, and European countries such as Spain and Portugal are also major perpetrators. The final act that I want to highlight is uh, large criminal groups uh, in uh, Latin America, particularly Mexican criminal groups that are now um, engaging um, uh, in illegal fishing or entering, I should say, illegal fishing, not just to promote the drug trafficking, uh, but uh, for its own sake. We are dramatically seeing that outside of the Southern Cone in Mexico with uh, the Mexican uh, Sinaloa cartel and cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion taking over both illegal fishing as well as legal fishing. But we are also seeing their expansion uh, to other parts of the region. For example, um, uh, off of Costa Rica, uh, a fishing industry that is excruciatingly poorly regulated, a frequent violator uh, of regulation, is no longer simply um, uh, smuggling uh, uh, drugs for the Mexican cartels, with some law enforcement officials telling me that perhaps 40-50% of Costa Rican uh, fishing ships perhaps engaged uh, in drug trafficking as well. Uh, this industry is no longer just also carrying precursor chemicals, but we are now seeing the Sinaloa cartel buying um, illegally caught fish off of uh, Central America, Costa Rica, the Northern Triangle, uh, transporting it and selling it um, in Mexico and perhaps elsewhere. And a particularly worrisome issue is now the intersection of fentanyl uh, trafficking and um, uh, illegal fishing. Why is that so worrisome? Because the cost of precursor chemicals for fentanyl, for synthetic opioids, the most dangerous lethal of drugs currently uh, in, uh, in use in global markets, uh, the precursor chemicals cost only tens of millions of dollars, only tens of millions of dollars, perhaps as low as $20 million. So it's very easy to pay for them in wildlife, whether it's terrestrial wildlife or marine wildlife, both by passing anti-money laundering regulations, uh, as well as depleting biodiversity resources. And there are very substantial likelihood that we are going to see the spread of this kind of barter, of this kind of value transfer between fishing and uh, illegal uh, drug trafficking between terrestrial species and wildlife, wildlife trafficking and drug trafficking in the Southern Cone as well. In Brazil, fentanyl use is popping up. Chinese fishing vessels have been documented to carry cocaine. They have been documented to carry precursor chemicals to the Southern Cone. A lot of danger uh, lies ahead. So why is IUU fishing such a uh, difficult enforcement challenge? We have been speaking about why uh, and how it uh, uh, creates severe threats. But why is it difficult to stem it? Well, there are several sets of issues uh, that uh, are a major challenge. We have already heard about um, some of them, but let me uh, just lay them out. We heard in um, great detail uh, from Ambassador Sosale the issues of regulation. And there are two sets of regulations. There are national regulations and international regulations, both of which suffer from challenges. In the Southern Cone, a lot of national regulation is often quite poor of fisheries in the first place. There are some countries like Chile with very advanced regulatory frameworks, and there are countries like Panama, Guyana with essentially non-existent regulatory frameworks. In Uruguay, there is a fairly robust regulatory framework, but its enforcement is essentially non-existent. 
And one reason why regulation uh, remains uh, a challenge, just even what is written on paper, let alone what is enforced, is because of the problem that I spoke about. The national fishing fleets are also often perpetrators of uh, major violation. So there might be limited political will to regulate. And then this coincides with the externality issue with the foreign fishing fleets that are heavily subsidized uh, that then creates a really very difficult problem. Second element of poor uh, regulation often is the temptations of flags of convenience and the desire to attract to ports um, uh, fishing uh, ships and other ships and provide services. Flags of convenience are one aspect of the fundamental lack of transparency in the fishing industry uh, regarding beneficial ownerships, which is often hidden uh, by layers of middlemen. And, uh, and uh, often in some countries, Panama is a prime example, uh, it's as simple as filling an online uh, application and paying a relatively small fee to flag one's uh, ship as the ship of Panama. Yet the countries that issue flags of convenience do not uh, have adequate uh, legal obligations to ensure that their ships are not in fact conducting illegal activity. Similarly, I mentioned the problem of uh, ports. Um, there is an international agreement on port state measures that mandates that uh, countries should deny access to ports to, fish, to, to ships engaged in uh, illegal IUU fishing. Yet that is rarely um, enforced in large parts of the world. And a place like Montevideo uh, in Uruguay uh, is a frequent offender, both because of the levels of corruption that permeate such settings, but also because countries want to attract um, the resources that uh, ships that come in to offload uh, fish, that come in to buy fuel, that come in to buy other supplies, get the repairs, bring. The third, uh, uh, sorry, the second issue why enforcement is a, a problem is that of detection and law enforcement response. The ocean is a vast place. Even the exclusive economic zones that are only 200 miles uh, off of one shoreline uh, are very large spaces. There is often limited monitoring capacity and this persists despite the fact that technologies such as um, AIS have emerged partially because uh, uh, violating ships uh, tend to spoof it, they, they hack it, or in the most basic way to frustrate uh, databases and monitoring system, they just go dark. But far beyond going dark, there are much more sophisticated uh, version of how to undermine the AIS systems. But even when illegal fishing is detected or suspicious activity is detected, like a ship all of a sudden goes dark, a response often takes times and resources. Translating uh, information into actionable intelligence and being able to respond quickly is often a significant problem. Again, there is vast variation in capacities. Countries like Argentina, Brazil, Chile have very large navies and fairly high density of uh, ships and uh, personnel to respond. Uh, but countries like Can uh, Panama, Ecuador, Guyana, Costa Rica um, uh, have much smaller capacities. And for some of the countries like Guyana, uh, the extent of the fishing of the enforcement fleet rather might be in the single digits. So essentially minimal to non-existent. Now there are, however, also um, uh, opportunities. And the one opportunity I want to highlight um, in conclusion, and perhaps I'll have uh, time to talk about other challenges if we have any time for Q&A, is uh, partnering with other countries, specifically partnering with the United States. Uh, the United States, such as through its Coast Guards, have been engaged in developing bilateral and sometimes multilateral um, uh, agreements to assist countries in monitoring um, uh, their uh, fishing uh, uh, areas, their exclusive economic zones through um, uh, ship rider uh, deals, but also through uh, the uh, use of US uh, ships for monitoring, uh, but in some cases also actual enforcement. Uh, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, this has been developing into significant um, uh, extent and there are real opportunities in um, uh, uh, the Southern Cone uh, to build up and beef up uh, those capacities. 
And I want to make one last point in uh, conclusion, and that is that um, it is very important that we really stop thinking in isolations about these different types of um, uh, criminality and dangerous, nefarious behavior. Even as I mentioned the fact that um, increasingly some of the same criminal groups are engaged in drug trafficking and illegal fishing, that they might be linked to state sponsors, uh, that uh, uh, fishing uh, ships might be carrying spy equipment, such as in the case of China, there tends to be a lot of bifurcated uh, capacities. Ma ma mandates tend to be extremely narrow. For example, in the US case, a lot of uh, capacities that have been built around the Caribbean basin uh, or uh, that extend uh, to uh, uh, countering narcotics trafficking cannot be applied to uh, illegal fishing. So the very same cartels is engaged in both drugs and illegal fishing, yet the United States can only focus on countering one aspect of that. It's time to break down those this stovepiping on the US side, as well as in how we think internationally about collaborating. Thank you, and I look uh, forward to um, uh, Mr. Clockers and his perspectives on enforcement. Thank you, Vanda, very much. Bueno, eh, en base a, a mi experiencia, digamos, eh, en la Prefectura Naval Argentina, el desafío del control de los espacios marítimos eh, abarca dos aspectos, los aspectos legales y los requerimientos técnicos y materiales. Un segundo ahí. Uh, in, based on my own experience as a, an officer at the Coast Guard, there are two main aspects. One related to, the first one is related to legal aspects. The second one is related to enforcement capacity. Una vez que, que se sancionó la Convención de, sobre los Derechos del Mar y la Ley de los Espacios Marítimos en Argentina, estas referían a posiciones de las líneas bases eh, eh, marcadas en una carta. Uh, once the law of the sea convention and local regulations in Argentina uh, were adopted, um, these instruments established a series of uh, line bases that were uh, drawn in maps, in nautical maps. Esas posiciones no eran muy precisas en orden a establecer sistemas electrónicos de posicionamiento porque básicamente estaban eh, al décimo de minuto, eh, la precisión era al décimo de minuto. These charts, these nautical maps, uh, were not precise enough because they, they were only uh, drawn um, um, based on um, grades and minutes and not seconds, and therefore uh, they didn't uh, provide the specificity to make uh, technological control and digital control of the uh, uh, sea spaces. In los últimos años, la Argentina eh, desarrolló un trabajo muy importante para determinar la plataforma continental. Y ahí se introdujeron significativos aportes tecnológicos eh, para eh, su marcación. Básicamente quedó bien establecida la línea de las 200 millas que delimitan la zona económica en eh, décimas de segundo. Argentina uh, invested significant resources in uh, generating a detailed map uh, by which uh, the, the spaces were uh, possible to be tracked not only in, in, in minutes, but, but in seconds. In 2020, la Argentina estableció por ley una nueva línea, una línea más precisa de la zona económica exclusiva, de la que todavía muchos organismos internacionales que que trabajan sobre todo con información de AIS, no han tomado nota y por eso los lleva a algunas imprecisiones respecto de la posición de barcos si están dentro o fuera de nuestra jurisdicción. En 2020, Argentina uh, established uh, this system by which the uh, exclusive economic zone was uh, specifically drawn uh, 
as, as I said, uh, in, in terms of seconds and, and not minutes. And uh, this has not been taken into account by certain international organizations that uh, therefore are unable to understand specifically what are the numbers of vessels that are inside or outside the uh, exclusive economic zone in Argentina. Los otros requerimientos legales es una ley, eh, la ley federal pesquera, donde establece claramente cuáles son las infracciones al régimen y la jurisdicción y competencia de los organismos que intervienen en su control. Uh, our uh, Argentine fishing law establishes which are the rules that need to be observed and what, what are the sanctions by those that, uh, to those that break those rules. En orden a los requerimientos técnicos y materiales, eh, hay dos, dos clases. Los, el personal y medios eh, que controla efectivamente los espacios marítimos a bordo de buques y aeronaves. En términos de la logística de enforcement, hay varias uh, dimensiones involved. Una es el personal y los específicos. Uh, ships that and airplanes that control the exclusive economic zone. Y en los últimos años los avances tecnológicos nos han permitido utilizar varios sistemas de vigilancia electrónica que nos dan una amplia imagen del dominio marítimo. And over the last years uh, the Argentine Coast Guard has been able to establish a series of systems that allow our country to uh, monitor uh, through uh, digital technolo technologies and electronic technologies what takes place in the in the limit of the economics exclusive zone. Para el control de el, eh, todo lo que es dentro de la zona económica exclusiva eh, con buques eh, de la flota propia, de la flota argentina o autorizados por Argentina, se utiliza un sistema de satelital de control pesquero que eh, tiene eh, la característica que puede ser, eh, tiene los mensajes siempre son confirmados, tiene todas las reglas de control, las áreas de pescas y las zonas de veda y hace un control totalmente automatizado. La característica principal Okay. Un minuto, ya me Argentina has a system of electronic control in its own waters, in its own e e economic uh, zone uh, that is uh, pretty much uh, detailed and able to track each vessel, uh, establishing where the, the vessel is uh, uh, located and in which areas Uh, ships can't access because they are prohibited for fishing. Eh, ese sistema estaban basado en, en satélites geostacionarios y los buques no pueden evitar el control. En todo momento la autoridad los puede interrogar por la posición o la actividad de los buques y son es un sistema eh, que de los mensajes son confirmados y de este y de gran eficiencia. This system is uh, conducted through uh, satellite information that is automatic and basically the Coast Guard is in constant communication with the vessels which need to confirm which is their position on sea and therefore they are able to be tracked uh, in real time. Subsidiariamente, se, la Argentina utiliza todas las otras tecnologías disponibles para el control de su área marítima y la subyacente. Estos sistemas son básicamente todos eh, instalados en sistemas satelitales. Uh, Argentina has also a series of complementary systems that are, that are also Uh, that also use uh, satellites as main ways of controlling its own uh, uh, jurisdictional waters. El sistema más importante es el AIS satelital, 
que brinda cierta información, eh, tiene la, el problema de que no, la persistencia no está siempre sobre, sobre el cielo, los satélites que, que, que transportan la información, sino que pasan cada hora. Eh, y también que son sistemas de mejor esfuerzo, no son datos confirmados, sino que el satélite hace el mejor esfuerzo por traer esa información a las bases. Um, the problem that the, these satellite uh, systems have uh, is that uh, satellites are not permanently located uh, on our waters and therefore uh, they travel and uh, go through uh, the area which they control uh, once each hour. And the second is that it's a system by which uh, there's they use uh, non-confirmed information, but best effort information, Perfect. which means that they convey the best information possible that they are able to, to produce. Para controlar grandes áreas se utilizan imágenes de radar que pueden cubrir áreas eh, por día, 250.000 kilómetros cuadrados aproximadamente por día, con lo que nos da una razonable imagen de los buques que no están transmitiendo. Uh, for those ships that are not transmitting their position, uh, the, the Argentine Coast Guard uh, relies on radar uh, images, which are able to produce each day control of around 2,050 square kilometers. Uh, and these uh, images are basically uh, produce information for those ships that are not collaborating with the Coast Guard by sending information voluntarily. Los buques Guaracosta y de la Armada que, que controlan la pesca ilegal, entonces pueden ser dirigidos a aquellas zonas donde hay mayor concentración de buques y donde particularmente se detectan que hay buques que no están transmitiendo. Uh, these images allow uh, vessels from the uh, Coast Guard and, uh, and ships from the armed forces to be sent to the areas in which there's a, a big concentration of uh, ships that are not transmitting information and that are fishing illegally. Eh, además, se utilizan otros sistemas, eh, todo el sistema de detección de, de rayos frecuencias o de luces, eh, todo lo cual hace que la Argentina considere que su zona económica exclusiva se encuentra razonablemente bien cubierta y controlada. Uh, there are additional systems of uh, sonar and radio frequency that are also used. Uh, which uh, considered uh, as a system uh, leads us to conclude that Argentina has a reasonable um, control over of its exclusive uh, economic zone. Las últimas capturas de buques que se han dado han sido siempre en, en el borde de la milla 200 en menos de, de una milla, muy poquito y sobre todo por la precisión que tienen los sistemas y los equipamientos que cuentan los guardacostas y los, los navíos de la Armada. Um, the ships that were um, captured in, in the last, over the last years uh, are basically ships that uh, trespass the uh, exclusive economic zone uh, for one mile or two. So they are in, in the limit of the economic zone and there are no, no cases of uh, ships uh, deep inside the economic zone, which uh, underscores the fact that these systems are uh, efficient in deterring ships of, of entering the economic zone of, of, of the country. And that's cerrando, Ernesto, si te parece. Sí. Para el control fuera de la zona económica exclusiva, los obstáculos son, como ya lo hemos visto acá, de orden legal a nivel internacional. Los medios técnicos y materiales se encuentran disponibles, son apropiados y podrían ampliar su zona a, por lo menos, las zonas eh, colindantes con la zona económica exclusiva. 
Se uh, necesitan. Uh, the, um, for the areas that are outside the economic exclusive zone, uh, the barriers that we find are basically legal. Uh, they are not uh, technological or logistical. Argentina could be in a position of uh, enforcing uh, the law in areas that are outside the economic zone, but of course we lack the uh, legal instruments to do so. Para desalentar la práctica de la pesca ilegal, eh, se necesitan convenios eh, internacionales como el convenio de biodiversidad que se está trabajando y también otras medidas como requisitos comerciales de exigir la trazabilidad de los productos pesqueros y requerir declaraciones de ética empresarial que puedan contribuir para desalentar las prácticas ilegales. Perfecto. Finally, uh, what uh, we need is uh, the advance of international regulations for illegal fishing and uh, the possibility of tracking the origin of the fishing uh, to the areas in which it was uh, produced uh, in order uh, to be able to control uh, sources of illegal fishing. Sí, finalmente que los estados deben procurar estudios más profundos fuera de la zona económica o áreas protegidas eh, para tener un conocimiento más acabado de la biodiversidad que merece ser protegida. And finally, uh, countries in the international community need to invest more resources in terms of um, producing specific uh, studies um, of uh, biodiversity of the seas that allow uh, a clear picture of what needs to be preserved in our ecosystems. Thank you very much. Gracias, Ernesto. Muchísimas gracias. No, gracias. Eh, pasamos a preguntas. Te paso la palabra, Diego. Bueno, gracias, Alberto. Nos vamos a extender unos minutos más en el programa. Eh, no mucho, pero bueno, quería mencionar un par de preguntas. Una dirigida, o wow, una ya realizada muy interesantes sobre el trolling en el es sobre en el suelo de las eh, fuera de la zona económica exclusiva que la pueden ver en el chat que se correspondía y además tenía dos preguntas más una dirigida I, I, I had two additional questions one for Ambassador Sale from Alvaro Martinez if you can explain uh, which are the reasons uh, why Argentina doesn't doesn't sign the agreement on Puerto State measures to prevent and deter and eliminate uh, illegal fishing. Uh, uh, that is one question. And another question is, otra question, otra pregunta es para Ernesto uh, Cochlar, respecto a si, eh, si tienen indicadores, más indicadores sobre eh, sanciones, multas, eh, o captura de buques, tanto internacionales como eh, en aguas eh, de zona económica exclusiva, nacion nacionales, para entender cuál es eh, el nivel real del force. Así que, eh, Carlos, eh, eh, please first you, and then Ernesto. Uh, thank you. Well, I may take the first to the question that Mr. Álvaro, uh, here is. Yeah, Alvaro Martinez. Um, well, very easy. Argentina is not a part, is not part of this initiative because it's not a member of the ERFMO. So if you are not joining that regional <clears throat> uh, agreement, you cannot be part of the of the party. It's um, there is a problem with the, the the problem of principle with the text. For instance. If a party is expect to, expected to enforce measures of RFMOs, to which is not a party, another problem with the road with the years, the blacklists. But basically, RFMOs include vessels in IUU blacklist, which are then shared by RFMOs. 
So basically you will enter in a game that you will be giving support on your coast to ships vessels or vessels that are already in the blacklist. So um, uh, therefore states are expected to prohibit the use of ports based on information uh, and there are accusations in that regard. Sometimes is need to, that sometimes are done just to disqualify fishing competitors. So basically, as a matter of principle, we didn't enter into that. Besides, you have the um, uh, Malvinas issue that also you have some legislation that doesn't allow any uh, specific vessels to come to the Argentina shores. But it's a principle, it's a matter of principle. Thank you. Ernesto. Sí, respecto a las capturas, eh, no las tengo en este momento aquí encima, pero en, en Argentina se, se vino dando eh, un hecho de que años atrás, antes de, básicamente antes de que se tengan los sistemas electrónicos de control, los buques que salían a controlar eh, se encontraban con los buques pesqueros dentro de la, bien adentro de, de la zona económica exclusiva. En los últimos años, ya con el advenimiento de la IS satelital y el conocimiento que tienen las flotas pesqueras de los sistemas de control que tiene Argentina, las capturas de buques pesqueros se dan muy en el borde a, a cables, o sea, a metros de la línea de 200 metros, de, de 200 millas, y básicamente muchas veces por errores o descuido de las tripulaciones pero ya tienen las, las tripulaciones de las flotas. Disculpame un segundito que traduzco. Sí. Um, Argentina, I don't have numbers in terms of how many uh, ships were captured over the last years, but what we see as a, as a pattern is that Argentina used to uh, capture uh, ships uh, performing illegal fishing deep inside its economic zone in the past. And what we see today after we uh, produced this series of satellite controls is that basically captures take place um, in the limit of the exclusive economic zone in the mile 199 or, or 198. Uh, and in many cases, uh, these uh, situations arise due to uh, the, the ships are, are not considering specific details of their position, but they are in many cases errors of the of the of those ships. Sí, en muchos casos también porque los buques utilizaban la línea de 200 de 200 millas del límite de la zona que no era el apropiado. Eh, eso se ha corregido en los últimos años y hoy este Creo que todos más o menos ya lo cuentan porque es esta información pública que ha, el, el servicio de grafía naval lo ha publicado. And what also happened was that uh, uh, the, the fleets uh, lacked the precise information on what was the precise limit. Uh, since uh, right now that information is public, it was produced and published by the hydrographic uh, system in Argentina. Uh, and now all of the fleets have this information available and therefore can avoid uh, incurring in, in, uh, in breaking the law. Uh, I have a, an additional question to Banda, who, lives to, who has to leave soon. Uh, that is, uh, if you can give more detail about this triangulation of money laundering, uh, drug traffic and traffic of uh, wild species or uh, illegal fish, uh, fishes? Great, thank you. Thank uh, you. What we are seeing very robustly in Mexico, and in my view will spread significantly throughout uh, the hemisphere and beyond, is that the large Mexican criminal groups, the Sinaloa Cartel and Cartel Jalisca Nueva Generacion, are paying for precursor chemicals in marine and terrestrial wildlife species as well as timber. 
These involve species that are um, uh, listed endangered uh, and, and listed under CITES, uh, like uh, Totoaba with the bycatch uh, uh, in the Vaquita Marina that um, uh, Dr. Mesnick spoke about. But it also involves species that are unregulated, such as jellyfish. For example, there is this massive out of control harvesting of jellyfish in the Sea of Cortez uh, that's uh, being shipped to China and is used as a mechanism to pay for uh, precursor chemicals. Uh, and uh, the, there are two dimensions to it that are worth highlighting. The important one is that this is highly associated with the spread of synthetic opioids. As I mentioned, synthetic opioids are the most lethal, dangerous drugs currently and ever um, uh, up till now uh, in uh, global drug markets, uh, but their production is very cheap. The, the entire extent of how much uh, it takes to produce uh, fentanyl for Canada and the United States might be just 10, 20 million dollars. And so all of a sudden paying in kind, paying in barter, such as wildlife species becomes very feasible. Uh, if the costs were uh, uh, hundreds of uh, millions or maybe a billion, wildlife resources would probably in any particular locale not be able to generate such income. But because precursors for synthetic opioids and for that matter for methamphetamine are very cheap, all of a sudden uh, these payments are feasible. This has many dangers. One is um, that uh, one important tool of, for law enforcement um, is being undermined. The um, anti-money uh, laundering systems that have been built into banking and financial services are being bypassed through this barter trade. Um, the other, obviously, is um, uh, the very significant impact on, on species. So all of a sudden, species are not being uh, exploited, overused, just for their own sake, but there is the new dimension of connection to uh, new forms of um, criminal activity. And uh, again, we, this has been a new phenomenon. I wrote a report on this that came out in the, um, the spring of 2022, so a year ago. Uh, but my expectation is uh, that we will see big expansion across markets, including uh, in Latin America, in the Southern Cone, uh, as we are seeing the expansion of, of uh, terrestrial uh, of, of trafficking in terrestrial species as well. Uh, I don't know, Alberto, we are running short of time because uh, Banda and Sarah uh, have to leave. I don't know if you or any of the speakers want to give any, any final comments or idea. And not on my side, I, I want to just thank uh, our speakers. They, we had a great conversation. Uh, I hope that this is uh, a start for uh, a series of exchanges on these matters. And uh, on, on our side, on the University of San Andres in Argentina, we are very pleased to have uh, hosted this, this conversation. and. Uh, I hope that uh, it was of, of uh, it was useful for uh, the persons that joined us today. Uh, thank you very much to all, and we'll see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm uh, and I hope that this conversation is the beginning uh, of a sustained uh, dialogue on a very important and increasing issue. So, very many thanks to Alberto and Diego. I and Brookings have been delighted to partner with you on doing this uh, first webinar and are hoping that this will produce a sustained conversation and sustained dialogue and, and uh, policy recommendation. Very many thanks to everyone. Thank, on the thank you very much, Vanda. Thank you.